My name is Zoltan LeVay, um, Imaging Group Lead in the Office of Public Outreach at the Space Telescope Science Institute. I'm primarily responsible for pr producing pictures from data from the Hubble Space Telescope. And these pictures accompany announcements of discoveries, uh, science discoveries from the Hubble Space Telescope. My formal training is in astronomy, but I've been doing photography for a long, long time, sort of self-taught photographer. And so I have a fairly extensive background in processing photographs, digital, digital imaging, digital photography. Combine that with an understanding of the data formats that come out of the telescope and what the images mean, what, what, what we're seeing in the images. And so that kind of informs how you deal with them in terms of making the images. Many images have kind of a natural color that you would like to see in the image. And it's just a matter of tweaking the data a little bit here and there to, to arrive at, at the color that you sort of want the image to be. The pictures that you see published and distributed are not what comes straight from the Hubble Space Telescope. The cameras on the telescope produce black and white images. The cameras are, the telescope and the instruments are designed to take data to help astronomers figure out what's going on in space. So they are designed to take the best astronomy data possible. They're not really designed to produce pretty pictures, but fortunately they're great data sets and they're great images and we can produce some really nice images from them. So the way we do that is since they're not color, the images are not, the cameras are not color cameras. Uh, a normal camera will split light apart into its component colors, red, green, roughly red, green, and blue, uh, take essentially separate images of those colors, and then reconstruct them and reproduce a color image from that. And that's exactly what we do with these images, only we have to do it more manually since the cameras themselves don't produce the color images. So we'll get separate images uh, in different colors, so this is an image that was originally in, in a blue-green light. Uh, and then we have other images. This was an image that was in, in red light, actually light primarily of hydrogen atoms, uh, atoms of hydrogen emitting. Uh, in, in the particular environment they're in, they're producing red light primarily. And images, an image in the light of sulfur which is also producing primarily red light. Uh, so we take these three images and we just convert them to color. So the image in sulfur light, we'll, we'll, we've reproduced in red here, and going from black to red instead of black to white. The image from hydrogen light, we've, we've translated that from the red into green, so we'll reproduce that as a green image. And the oxygen, uh, this is the light of, of oxygen atoms, uh, we'll, we'll make that blue. So we're using the normal primary colors, red, green, and blue. They're additive primaries, similar to the way our eyes operate, separate the white light in the scene into red, green, and blue light. And then our brain reconstructs that into a color image. And so when we uh, recomposit that into a color image, those three separate primary color images, this is kind of what we end up with. Um, and then, then we have basically a photograph, a digital photograph. And just as any photographer might uh, work on the pictures that are, come straight out of their camera, they might improve the color or uh, change the color, the contrast and brightness of the image. We do the similar sorts of things to get as much as possible out of the image. We want to see as much detail there. We want to see as much information that's inherent in the data in the darkest parts of the image and in the brightest parts of the image. So those are the kind of steps we go through. We end up with uh, something like that. And I gotta say, there's also a lot of processing that goes on before essentially my part of it starts to produce the data sets in this, in this form. Some of that's automatic, some of that happens with all the data um, that the astronomers get. The data are what are termed calibrated to put them in a, in a consist, to make the data consistent so you can compare one observation to another observation, whether they were taken by the same instrument or different instruments. In this case, uh, this was actually four separate pointings of the telescope. So we actually have a small mosaic that was then stitched together. 
and there's some people that are very expert at doing that. That's not something that's routinely done with science data, but for these kinds of images, we'll, we'll make very careful uh, composites of the data, uh, very careful mosaics of the data. Um, that process can take hours to days. Uh, the process of putting the images into color, again, can take as little as a few minutes, maybe several hours, and then fiddling with the details of getting the color and so forth right um, can take as long as you want to spend on it. Most of the images we work on really are to illustrate the science that Hubble has done. And so in that case, we're working very closely with an astronomer, the observer who, usually the observer who took that data, or at least the astronomer who analyzed the data and came up with some discovery, some finding that, that we're publicizing. And in that case, uh, we do review the images and the, all the graphics and the text that we produce. Um, we work very closely with the astronomers, um, certainly to make sure whatever we're showing has scientific validity. So we're not misrepresenting anything, we're not misleading anyone that something's there that, that the astronomer thinks shouldn't be there or vice versa. So yes, we work very closely with a large um, group of people and beyond the science side, there's the approval side through NASA and the mission. So all, all our content has to be, uh, is, is um, reviewed by numerous layers. <laughs> this image is the newest image we've done to, uh, this was made to commemorate the 25th anniversary of the Hubble Space Telescope. It's uh, called, it, it's a star cluster and a surrounding uh, nebulous region where new stars are being formed. The star cluster is called Westerland 2, it's a name out of a catalog, and the larger region is known as GUM-29, again a sort of catalog name. In addition to producing the color image, which is a combination of visible light data and infrared data, we produced a 3D visualization of this. We don't have any real numerical information to tell us where things are in a 3D volume in this area. By educated understanding of what this kind of area represents. We have a pretty good idea of where things lie in, in three-dimensional space. But based on that sort of educated guessing, we're able to produce a visualization that allows us to fly through this region of space. We see that stars, we're flying through a field of stars, and each of those stars is placed in this 3D volume individually. And we've separated out the nebulosity into various regions and planes and are able to place those into the virtual 3D model in a realistic way so that we can have a camera fly through that volume past all these features and end up seeing this cluster um, much more up close.